Hi, my name is Jill Santiago and I serve as the Director of the Center for Social Justice and Human Understanding at Suffolk County Community College. And this is By Design, the History of Oppression on Long Island. By Design is a documentary series focused on the many stories of our past that have contributed to shaping our landscape. While Long Island has a rich, beautiful history, it is also infused with stories often hidden in the shadows that have left us with a legacy of inequity and racism. This series aims to shed light on those stories as a way to begin righting the wrongs of our past. Today I'm talking with Susan Wood, a librarian from the Eastern Campus of Suffolk County Community College on the subject of banned books. Hi Susan, thank you so much for being willing to speak yes. about this issue. Thank and you. I've been really excited to talk with you about it because I think it's something that we're both really passionate about mm -hmm. and that I'm really happy to be bringing awareness um, to, the, to the issue. So I thought before we get started, it might be helpful to talk about what does it mean to ban a book. Um, before we get started talking about the issue of book banning, I was hoping that maybe you could give us a definition of what it is. I think that sometimes there's some misconceptions about mm -hmm. what it means to ban a book and what the consequences of banning a book are. Okay, um, yes, that's a great place to start. So. Um, the simplest way of understanding what's happening with banned books in the United States is to think about what it's not. So one misconception is that the government will pick books and mandate titles that nobody can read. And this is a misconception. This is not how it happens. Um, and actually, this misconception kind of comes from literature, uh, books like Fahrenheit 451, where they have stories about censorship. And that's a book that itself has been censored mm -hmm. many times. Um, so we might imagine that the book is contraband and that publishers aren't allowed to print it anymore, that copies have been forcibly removed from libraries and bookstores, and that if you're caught with a copy, you might get arrested or fined. Um, and it's not like that at all in the United States. Um, another misconception is that librarians are book banners. And as a librarian, I can say that we're emphatically not. Um, the role of a librarian is to create accessible, diverse collections that serve the needs of everyone in the community, the information needs. And therefore, we seek to have as many different accessible points of view available. Um, so librarians are also not book banners. Um, typically, the way book banning happens in the United States is that an individual person will take issue with a particular book. Maybe they think it's not appropriate for children, or maybe they think it's objectionable in a, in a bigger sense and no one should be reading it. Um, so they will go to their local school library, their local public library, or even bookstores and try to get the book removed from the shelf. So it's individual people focusing on individual titles, and it happens at the local level. So it's fragmented. So a book might be banned in one school, but not in another. So that's kind of the nuances of how it looks in the US. Thank you for that. Now, we know there's been this extraordinary intensification um, in efforts to ban books and also in the number of books that are being banned. So I think it's helpful to give some, some information on that. You know, how many books are being banned and what is driving the intensification of, of of books being banned right now? Okay, so that's, um, it's such a complex question. Um, the American Library Association, which is a professional organization of North American librarians, has an Office of Intellectual Freedom, and it's a freedom to read advocacy organization, and they collect data on banned books, as does uh, PEN America um, and other advocacy organizations. Um, in the first half of 2023, over 4,000 unique titles, that means separate books, 4,000 different books have been targeted, either challenged or challenged and then actually banned. Um, this is a 20% increase from the same period in 2022, which itself is a massive increase from what has happened in the past. So we're, in, we're seeing a real spike in mm. challenge activity and in banning activity. Um, also, the way it's happening is really different. So I mentioned a moment ago that it's you know one person who takes issue in a community with a book and goes mm -hmm. to that particular school or library. Right. But um, what's happening now is we're seeing partisan organizations, um, like for example, Moms for Liberty, which happens to be a conservative organization. Mm -hmm. And what they're doing is circulating lists of books that fall into certain categories, books about race and racism, books about the LGBTQ community, um, books about sex ed, inclusive sex ed, and they're circulating these big lists of books and encouraging community members
members to go to their libraries and demand that the books be removed. And the people who are doing this may not have even read any of these mm. books. It's mm. enough that they're on a list. Right. Now, you mentioned PEN America, an organization that is focused on ensuring our right to the freedom of, of expression. Mm. And I, I guess, what is what are they seeing? You shared a chart um, with me prior to this interview that talked about some of the content. What are, what are you seeing in terms of the content? What is being banned most? So the um, the themes of the themes that t tend to cause people to have a knee-jerk reaction and want to ban books really haven't changed over the years. The themes are things like um, death and dying, grief, mental health, um, drug and alcohol use, sex the LGBTQ community, anything that deals with um, race and racism. But a big change we're seeing now is that a lot of the books are being in, are kind of in a category that you might call systemic inequalities. Mm -hmm. So anything that looks at the history of the United States and points out racism and points out these inequalities, these are getting a lot of attention right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the main concern there, and, and this is what you hear people who don't like these topics, um, they talk about the idea that talking about racism is somehow divisive or that talking about racism would make um, white children feel guilty or mm -hmm. responsible. Yes. Um, and I think really what underlies that, the subtext, is that these books are, they view them as being unpatriotic or as overly critical of mm -hmm. the United States. Um, and they don't want that in the ethos. They don't want people talking about those subjects. Um, there's also an element of white grievance mm -hmm. that's going on. Um, and then the other main category that we're seeing a lot of intensification right now is with the LGBTQ community. So books by and about people of color that address racism and then anything about um, gender diversity or sexual diversity. Librarians are in a very challenging position here. As professionals, you are the champions of freedom and expression and all of those things. And can you talk about, you mentioned that libra librarians are not the ones that are banning books, so can you talk about what is the librarian's role and how do they fit into what is happening here? Right, um, so I'm an academic librarian, so I'm really insulated from what's going on because the censorship activity is mainly taking place in school and public libraries. Um, we just don't see the same kind of activity in higher ed. Um, one role that librarians do play in, and I think this is a very positive thing. So um, most libraries are going to have a policy in place, a procedure for members of the community to challenge books that they find in the collections. And that's a good thing. Um, the policy might look like the community member will have to actually write out a justification, a rationale for why they think the book should be either moved from the children's section to the young adult or taken out of the library altogether. And um, the requirements for that are not just to say this book should be banned, but to actually point to specific content on specific pages and then to write out a justification about why this is a problem. And then librarians will review this content um, and decide if the argument has merit. And then that might result in the book being restricted, which means it's maybe moved back behind the desk or moved to a different section, or it might result in the book being removed from the collection altogether, or they might find that the um, challenge doesn't have any merit and that the book doesn't need to be, you know, nothing needs to happen with it. Right. Um, and that's a healthy process, and mm -hmm. I think that's a process that all libraries should do. Um, but what's happening now is that that process is being undercut. So sometimes you might have a principal at a school or a school superintendent who knows about these lists of books that are being circulated and directs the librarians to remove them from the shelves preemptively to avoid bad controversy mm -hmm. um, or bad publicity. You also have um, things like state legislatures coming up with categories of information that teachers and librarians are not supposed to talk about. Mm -hmm. So in the state of Oklahoma, for example, which is my home state, in 2021, uh, they passed a law that said um, teachers cannot talk about topics that might cause children to feel any psychological distress, guilt, anguish. Mm. And what they're talking about is trying to misguidedly protect white children. Right. Um, and it's, it's a real misunderstanding of what it means to talk about racism. Yeah. Um, because no conversation about racism is going to include any finger pointing. Of course. Um, it's yeah. not about that. It's looking at history. Um, 
but because people don't want these topics talked about, this is a roundabout way. Mm -hmm. So what this has happened is created a really chilly climate for librarians and teachers because you're simply trying to avoid a hypothetical student response. Right. So how do you know which topics? Can you talk about MLK? Can right. you talk about slavery? What, what can you talk about? And you can be reported, um, and if found in violation of the law, you can lose your license to teach. Yeah, um, God, it's extraordinary. It is. I, I just think as somebody that teaches history and Holocaust history specifically, I wonder if you could talk about this in the broader sense. I mean, when we think about societies that engage in this type of censorship, what does that mean? I mean, you know, thinking about a censoring a, or, or a teacher or a librarian losing their license over something that they say that's factual. I mean, these are the facts. History is real. And I think that it's a whole purpose of this series is to bring these these shameful parts of our history into the light so that we can talk about it and we can move beyond it. But I guess if for the purposes of this conversation and censorship, I mean, what, what can you tell us in the broader context? Well, I think that all cultures engage in censorship activity um, in different points in history, and there's peaks and valleys of that activity. Um, Nazi Germany, obviously, uh, the Chinese Cultural Revolution in the mid-20th mm -hmm. century, a lot of censorship there. It's really about um, I think it's a fear-based reaction. It's mm -hmm. about trying to slow down social change or rewind social change by controlling what people know. Um, sometimes it's trying to erase the existence of a group of people. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, transgender people. Um, right now they're really being scapegoated mm -hmm. in politics. And this is one of the areas where um, what you might hear from the perspective of a Christian nationalist, which is where a lot of this activity is coming from, mm -hmm. is that any discussion of non-binary gender identities, they would call that a radical ideology. That's the term that you hear a lot. And they refer to education as being a bastion of progressive mm -hmm. ideals. Yep. And they refer to public education as an indoctrinating process. Um, and I really think that stems from the idea that uh, social change, to some people, it feels like it's happening really fast. Mm -hmm. To target groups, it feels like it's not happening fast enough. Yeah, yeah. But if, you are, if you're feeling like your, your country is moving away from the values that you always thought everyone held, it's, I think, a moment of panic. I think it sure. feels kind of apocalyptic. Yeah. Um, and so the, the idea is, well, let's just change education. Let's change what, mm -hmm. what can be taught. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that comes from a fear-based reaction. It's trying to, to stifle social change. It's trying to stifle perspectives that you don't agree with. You made some really amazing points there about the overall sentiments in the country, the emotion that people are feeling, and I think most importantly, the fear people have in trying to hold on to their value system and what they think is right. I read somewhere that if you're afraid the ideas in books might change someone, you're not really afraid of books, you're afraid of ideas. And I think that what you just said captures that so perfectly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What about what's happening at the local level? Well, um, so a lot of this activity is concentrated in the so-called red states, uh, Florida and Texas in particular, uh, Pennsylvania as well. Um, but it's happening on Long Island, it's happening everywhere. Um, I can talk about Smithtown Public Libraries. So in the summer of 2022, the Library Board of Trustees, which is made up of elected citizens who serve on the board, um, they voted to remove and restrict the LGBTQ content from the children's section, as well as to remove pride displays because it was June, it was Pride Month. Um, and this was met with a lot of backlash and a lot of resistance. It became something that was in the media. Everyone picked up the story. Uh, Governor Hochul um, directed the State Division of Human Rights to investigate this as discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation, which is illegal in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and consequently, the board reversed its decision fairly quickly. Um, I attended the board meeting that happened after the reversal, and it was it was ugly. There was no civil discourse happening. Mm. People were yelling. Um, someone might stand up to uh, defend the board's original decision, and they would be met with jeers and people yelling homophobe, and you're ignorant, and nobody's listening to each other. 
and then someone might stand up to praise the board for reversing the decision, and they were met with people screaming out, pedophile, groomer. Um, it was really an ugly, ugly spectacle. Yeah. yeah, there was no civil discourse happening. Wow. Is there a particular band book that really stands out for you? There's so many, there's so many. Um, so one that I want to talk about is Gender Queer. Um, this is by Maya Kobabe. Um, Maya is non-binary and asexual, and this is a graphic novel memoir. Um, and it's a coming of age memoir. So it deals with themes like your first period, uh, early sexual activity, masturbation. Um, these are themes that young adults are thinking about and right. experiencing. This is nothing out of the ordinary. Um, but in particular, for two main reasons, it's, it's come to a lot of people's attention. Um, the first reason is that uh, Kobabe is non-binary and asexual, which are LGBTQ designations. And um, if you are not comfortable with the visibility and the progress that the LGBTQ community has made, this is just something that you don't want to see out there. Right. It's also often banned because it's misunderstood. So it's a graphic novel, which means it's a story told in illustrations and words, primarily illustrations. So some folks I've heard talk about this book as being aimed at children because it has illustrations, not right. understanding that graphic novels are written for adults and young adults as well. Um, this book is not a children's book. It would not be shelved in the children's section of a library. It would not be taught to elementary school students. It's a young adult um, graphic novel. But because of that misunderstanding, um, there's, it's enabled a lot of rhetoric. People will hold up the book with the pictures and say, look, children are reading this. It's so terrible. Um, but you know, most children aren't reading it. And, it. and it's not appropriate for children. Some children, maybe, not mm -hmm. all children. Mm -hmm. But for young adults, these are the things that young adults experience. No 13-year-old no, uh, is going to be shocked by a book that mentions your first period or masturbation mm -hmm. or coming to understand your sexual desire. Um, really the only people that are being protected, and this is dubious argument, would be children that haven't experienced any hardship. Right. And suddenly you're exposing them to something like, um, like this book, The Perks of Being a Wallflower. This is one of my favorite books. Um, this is set in the early 90s, which was when I was in high school, so it's very sentimental to me. And it's a book about a first year student named Charlie who has experienced sexual abuse and the suicide of his best friend and he's having a hard time, and he's befriended by a group of older students, one of whom is gay. And some of the themes are drug use, drug experimentation, violence, rape. Um, there's a lot of heavy-duty things happening in this book. But it's also a book about selflessness and generosity, um, the value of kind teachers, healing, mm. resilience. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a positive book. It doesn't condone sexual right. abuse, it simply confronts it. Right. Um, but if, you, if you're not thinking about the difference between literature that addresses a theme in, in multiple ways, if you're thinking that if a topic is in a book, that it must be condoning and celebrating that topic, right. um, you would be unhappy with this book. But it's, it's not a shocking book for any teenager to read. Right. Going back to um, what you mentioned before about a young person seeing themselves in a book, can you talk about mm. the value of that? Oh, it's everything. Representation is everything. Mm. If you don't see people like yourself mm -hmm. represented in literature, because literature is the stories that a culture tells. Movies and TV are also stories that a culture tells. And if you're absent from that discourse, it's as though you don't exist mm -hmm. or that you're abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, you might get the feeling that you're the only one who's like you or who's experiencing certain problems. Um, and this can be devastating. This might make you, you know, want to give up on everything. Mm -hmm. um, people who see themselves represented in stories all of the time, white people, straight people, mm -hmm. uh, men, you take that for granted. You just think that that's how the world is, but that's not how the world is for everybody. So being able to see yourself in literature is, I think, crucial for healthy human development. Yeah, thank you. What can people who are concerned about book bans do to challenge this movement right now? Um, I think the, the most important thing is to raise your awareness of the problem. So 
learn about how book banning happens and, and what the misconceptions are and what's really going on. Um, I would recommend that people set up a Google News Alert or whatever platform they're on and mm -hmm. use keywords like uh, censorship or book banning so you can see, you'll get emails every day right. with a million different stories of a book ban in this school, a book ban in this public library, a librarian being fired. So find out how deep this rabbit hole goes. Mm -hmm. um, also pay attention to local elections. Mm. So find out who's running. School boards and library boards have a lot of power. So yes. find out who's running, go to the meetings, um, see what the agenda is, and vote accordingly. Vote according to your beliefs. Right. Um, there's also organizations like PEN America, American Library Association, the ACLU, Freedom to Read, which is an advocacy, a grassroots advocacy organization. You can donate to them. You can go to their websites and sign petitions. Um, you can donate books that are then mailed to communities where this book banning activity is really concentrated. So there's a number of things you can do, but I think awareness of the problem is the number one. Yeah, I agree. So what about what we're doing here at Suffolk County Community College? to raise awareness. Can you speak to that? Yes. Um, so we've had um, a lot of fun with this, actually. Mm -hmm. um, the libraries have partnered with the LGBTQ task force, and we've had two banned book readouts. So we did those on the steps of the Huntington Library here on the Ammerman campus. And we just had administrators, staff, faculty, and a few students would read passages from their favorite banned book. Um, some of the books that we have here today mm -hmm. people were reading from. Um, and that was a lot of fun, and you got to hear, hear these books that maybe you wouldn't have read otherwise, and yeah. it helped you think about why would somebody find this particular passage objectionable. Or offensive, yeah. Or offensive, yeah. Or, or dangerous for mm -hmm. children, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, also, we hosted a panel discussion. We had representatives from um, anti-censorship um, advocacy organizations like Freedom to Read, and we had some high school students from Florida who are activists who were protesting the bans that had happened in their community. Mm -hmm. And so we had a great panel discussion that the whole college community was invited to hear. And we all learned a lot from that. Yeah, I was on that call and it was really, really informative, very eye opening. And I think just the numbers alone, you mentioned the number 4,000 titles before. It's really, it's a shocking number. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really walked away having learned a lot from that program. And I hope that we do more. I hope that we continue mm -hmm. this conversation. Um, I think that this was a great start today. And I hope that students really are, have their eyes opened by it, that they feel enlightened and, as you said, you know, spread that awareness mm -hmm. of what's going on. I think that's the best way to combat this. So thank you for taking the time to talk with us. Yeah. Thanks I for having me. Thank, thank you. you.